Good morning. I'm here with my coach, Jeff. He's joining me for coffee time. Oh my God, so good. I introduced him to Wawa last night. He thought, I said, let's go for dessert. He said, where do you want to go? I said, I took him to Wawa, of course. We got to the gas station. We filled the car with gas. He says, are we going for dessert? I'm like, no, this is it. This is Wawa. This is New Jersey. <laughs> so we went to um, Wawa for dessert. It was delicious. They didn't, they didn't let me down. Anyway, of course, I bought him Wawa this morning. But what we're, what we're going to talk about today is self-talk. And Jeff flew all the way in from California to help me improve my self-talk because sometimes I'm not my own best friend. And sometimes I'm mad at myself like I wouldn't be mad at anybody else, and I say terrible things to myself. And that's why Jeff is here, to help <laughs> me stop doing that. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, Dr. Crean. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, I, I think when we were deciding on the title for this episode, it's Warning Which Self is Talking. And uh, there's a couple different ways we could break that down, right? Um, I'll start with the intentional self or the unintentional self is it the default self is the self-talk like a default is it something that happens just kind of automatically where all of a sudden you hear this voice or is it intentional are you choosing like what do i want to say to myself right now so those are two ways to break it down I, i'm going to let you comment on that before we uh, look at another way of breaking down which self is talking but do you have that experience of sometimes yourself is just talking as a default or almost um, effortlessly versus an intentional choice in terms of what you will say to yourself? Well, I feel like when I make the intentional choice of what I'm going to say, yeah. it's much nicer. Yeah. I'm much nicer to myself if I intentionally like look in the mirror and say to myself, mm, you look good today, or that's going well. But when I have no intention, I almost feel like my default is a very critical voice in my head, like, oh my God, you look old, look at that, that doesn't match, or something very negative, like you shouldn't have said that. You, It's very judgmental, evaluative, and like there's a new movie out, Mean Girls, I'm the mean girl to myself. I would never say it to anybody else. Well, here we go, when's the first time you were mean to yourself? And, and there's a chance maybe somebody else was mean to you before you were mean to yourself. Are you patterning anybody else's behavior that you've experienced in your life? For example, who's the per first person to tell you, oh, you shouldn't say that? I'm sure it's one of my parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, usually we get a lot of early influence from our parenting, and God bless our parents, right? They just want what's best for us, right? I mean, sometimes maybe they want what's best for them, and they don't want the children to embarrass them, depending on what area you grew up and uh, what's, what social grace means and so forth. But think about this. Um, how many times as a little child, if a parent is trying to protect the child, keep the child from getting hurt, how many times does a child hear, no, don't, stop, wait, no, don't, stop, wait, no, don't, stop, wait? How many times do you think a two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old hears those words, no, don't, stop, wait? So is there a chance that maybe that's what we're telling ourselves when it's time to take a chance or make an investment or move forward or start a business or make a decision or choose something to the exclusion of other things. Maybe we hear that parent's voice in our head saying, no, don't, stop, wait. And this is like, you know, one of the, um, I think, reasons that the comfort zone gets created. No, don't, stop, wait. Wow. I heard those those words a lot. Yeah. <laughs> we, I heard we, I'm those sure we words a lot. Mm -hmm. I never really looked at that as a group of wordings that like defines my childhood, but really. Well, I wouldn't take it too personally because I think I'm speaking for all of us, really. I mean, maybe if anybody's watching out there, comment or hit like or, uh, you know, put an emoji up there. If, if you, as a parent, have the experience of telling your children, no, don't stop, wait, or you, as an adult, remember, as a child, hearing your parents tell you, no, don't stop, wait. Again, God bless our parents. They love us. They're just trying to keep us from being safe, but sometimes... That effort creates a pattern that we model later on as self-talk. Maybe we're just patterning some other behavior that we experienced when we were younger. So, you know, as a hypnotist, I'm kind of in the change business. Yeah. <laughs> and I really, truly believe 
that the amygdala, that part of the brain, that's like your old memory part that really protects you, it's almost impossible to change it. You could transform some thoughts and you could replace some thoughts, but it is difficult to change old beliefs about yourselves or not hear your mother or father's voice in your head, one of them. Mm -hmm. From the amygdala. Right, because I think the amygdala is the area of your brain that's the primitive brain and it's all about survival. Okay. Well, I'm interested in your thoughts on, because I haven't studied the brain the way that you have, right? I, I just have a master's degree in communication. I don't have a PhD the way you do in the yeah. areas that you do. Um, I'm curious about the hypothalamus. Well, they're all related. Well, of course, of course, of course. I'm, uh, what I'm asking about specifically the hypothalamus is because my understanding is that's the area of the brain that manufactures emotion, that creates the chemicals associated with the emotions that we experience. Right, so basically the amygdala sends messages right away to the hypothalamus, mm -hmm. like instantly, yep. to say, okay, this is danger. The amygdala can't decide if it's real danger or perceived danger. Right. So it right away sets those chemicals. Being a dentist, I'm very aware of the fact that those chemicals come to us. The amygdala gets stimulated by your senses. Mm -hmm. So if you walk into a dentist's office and the smell, the sound of the drill, the 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 atmosphere, it's like a multi-sensory approach yep. that right away is starting to get those chemicals started. Once the chemicals are started... The chemicals that are created in the hypothalamus, that's right? That's correct. Okay. Once those chemicals get started, and that fight-or-flight reaction goes, you are headed down that road. Your whole body can't think of anything else because there are more connections going from the, from the amygdala to the cortex than the other direction. So, in other words... Like when you tap the, the smart part of your brain, mm -hmm. the part that has reasoning and logic, that part doesn't kick in so fast because it's just overwhelmed. It can't get the message back to the amygdala to say, stop producing so many chemicals. There's just not as many pathways in that direction. So what I like to say is that um, emotion shows up to the party first. And hopefully, if we're lucky... Logic will arrive fashionably late, stay longer, and help clean up. But emotion is usually the first responder, the first to show up, knock on the door, and tap the keg, and get the good pours before logic shows up. I, I, I went to San Diego State University, so sometimes I speak in terms of keg party right, metaphors. Right, exactly. Perfect. But I attended and survived 18 consecutive semesters at San Diego State. So this gets to this other distinction between which self is talking. Is it the emotional self or the logical self? I started off asking you about the intentional versus the unintentional, and now I want to ask about the logical self, the one that chooses, you know, the same process that knows that 2 plus 2 is 4, or, if, hey, if I let go of this coffee, it will, because of gravity, that rationalizes and makes sense of things versus the emotional. Because what happens to those chemicals when they fire in the hypothalamus? What happens if, they, if we're focused on a thought for 90 seconds, 120 seconds, 2 minutes, 3 minutes? What happens? Can we create emotional flood? Won't the hypothalamus keep producing that chemical? And will well, it stay the in the hypothalamus? Well, gets hijacked, so yes, absolutely. So will the chemicals stay in the brain, or will they actually flood over, overspill, overflow from the brain into the rest of our nervous yeah, system? exactly. And then, like, syringes going into a vein or keys going into a lock, won't those chemicals then, in, you know, inter, like, uh, interject themselves into the cells yep. of our body? Mm -hmm. And so like a crack baby when the cells replicate aren't they going to be craving the chemicals that the parent cell have i don't know about that this is way over my head what i really want to get that <laughs> it's way over my head the well, what, what i'm getting is the cellular like craving right so uh, let, me, let me give you another example a cigarette smoker never says i think it's a good idea to have a cigarette right now i think uh, it will be attractive i think it will be productive i think it will extend my years i think it will make me smell good that's not the thought process. It's not the self-talk that a cigarette smoker has. It's, oh, I need to smoke. Oh, I got to have a smoke. Oh, or smoke would be so good right now. And so where's that coming from? It's not coming from the logical brain, right? Because it's not logically true that somebody needs to smoke. It's got to be coming from a cellular level, craving, uh, craving the chemical. So what I'm, the distinction I'm making is sometimes our self-talk is logical from this part of the brain, 
And other times the voice that we hear in our head is a, is, a, is a rationalization that we're making to give the cells in our body what they're craving, so whether it's sugar you, or so nicotine or caffeine. So what do you do when you're headed down that path of negativity? Like, how do you stop it? How do you stop those Wonderful. chemicals? Um, well, first of all, it, I, I think the first step is awareness. You have to be aware because you can't do anything until you're aware, right? Why would you, right? You just keep going, right? So awareness uh, is the first step, but then I, I, it's it's what I call napkins in the glove box, right? I prescribe, like if I'm driving in my car, I'll put napkins in my glove box so in case I spill my coffee, I don't have to think. I don't have to pull over and freak or panic or what next or what have you. I just, I can keep driving without looking, grab the napkins and stop the negative thing, Does that make sense? which is in this case the spill. So napkins in the glove box, um, I'm looking at a picture of Tony Robbins over there. I think, I think he's maybe who I learned it from. Um, you know, the language choices, the beliefs that we focus on, and the physiology that we enact, right? Those are the three ingredients of a mood or a state of mind, right? Mm -hmm. So if I, if I have prescribed, written out ahead of time, decided up front, well in advance, what two or three beliefs I'll focus on, what, uh, what posture shift or what movement shift I'll make, or what breathing manipulation I'll make, or what affirmations I'll, uh, I'll, I'll say out loud, then I can intervene on a negative state of mind, a negative mood, a negative chemical, and replace it with a positive chemical. So instead of saying, for example, if I was addicted to cigarettes, instead of saying, God, I really need to smoke, I could immediately say, I'm a non-smoker, and just say that out loud for 30 seconds. I'm firm, I'm steadfast, I'm unwavering, I'm stronger than nicotine, I'm a world-class coach. And if I say those things out loud, that will intervene in the unintentional default self-talk. I'm using intentional self-talk to create different chemicals and let those get into my system instead. So I guess that's a good idea. So what I'm <laughs> going to suggest is, as you know, I have affirmations written on all my mirrors in my house. One of them says, you look amazing today. And that's there to remind me that my, that negative self-talk about my aging, when I read it, it says, you look amazing. And she does. Thank you. The other one that I have is, you have a big day, enjoy it. And, you know, as I, you know, I always tell my kids, well, tomorrow's a big day, go to sleep, be well rested. So I already put affirmations up. So I would love to suggest to you, put some affirmations around your house. Because we do need reminders, because there's so much negativity. We, we obviously are chemically programmed to repeat negativity that we know already. That's right. So my big suggestion for this coffee time so good, is put some affirmations around your house. In my son's room, I put them on the shelves, every shelf when he opened up his armoire. I know armoires are not in style right now, but wherever you have shelving, I put messages on shelving. You can hide it, you can expose it, whatever you want to do, but don't not have them because when you need them, you definitely need them. Can I take it just one step further? Yep. In addition to putting them up, read them out loud, right? And if, and if, you're really struggling in an area with negative self-talk. If you're not liking the message that you say to yourself, go ahead and predetermine what a positive message is. I'm going to say a step further. Put it up. Look yourself in the mirror. Make deep eye contact with yourself and start telling yourself the truth. Give that a try. Well, give that a try. Let me know how that works out. I'll see you tomorrow. Have a great day. Bye.